Hey AP World, Miss Z here for Unit 5 and Unit 6 of getting you ready for the AP exam and organizing your notes. Hello NNE, NYE, welcome in. How are you doing? Oh, I'm hoping you had a good day. Uh, it's Thursday, Friday Eve, right? So at least we've got that. Welcome in, guys. If you haven't joined, I think you guys are both on the YouTube uh, reminder, but if you haven't, the uh, text message and the information is running across on that ticker. Also, don't forget, tomorrow at noon, we are playing a big Jeopardy competition against Mr. Stoutberg's class, so I'd love to have you guys for that. Hey, Rachel and Carol, welcome in tonight. So I have a couple of things I wanted to tell you. Um, I am going to be doing Unit 6 on the 19th. I have not had time to type that out yet, but I'm going to do that this weekend and then I will send it out in the remind so that you'll have a link to that. What you need to do before Tuesday is sit down, have everything set out, like how you're going to take the test. So have your notes, just have everything there for you, okay? Just like you're gonna do it on the day so that you can practice that. Set a timer for 45 minutes and write it. Limit yourself to 45 minutes. Really try to not go over that. And then in that document, I'm also going to put a link to a Google form that you can insert your DBQ to that so that I can look at it before Tuesday. And then on Tuesday, instead of going over it and writing it together in the live, what I'll do is go over different parts of people's DBQs and we'll talk about how to support the documents a little bit more because I know that's where a lot of people struggle. And we'll talk about the explains part. Instead of wasting our time going through the DBQ and looking at the documents, I feel like most of you guys have that down. You need to practice actually doing the time. So that's kind of how we're going to treat that. If you are not a part of the Remind yet, the uh, information is right there in the ticker, so just join that Remind. I will send out a link to uh, the documents of the, the DBQ probably Saturday. I'm going to try to get it done on Saturday. And then that way you guys will have some time, sit down with that timer, and then after you're done, submit it through the Google form, and then I will check it out, okay? When I go over it on Tuesday, I'm not gonna say, oh, this is Rachel's paper, and this is what she did wrong. Like, no, I won't embarrass you like that. But what I'll be doing is like taking bits and pieces of your DBQ and talking about it and talking about you know why maybe you didn't get the thesis point or whatever, but I'm not gonna call you out. Okay, great, Rachel. Glad you like that idea. Uh, hi, Cloudy. How you doing? Cloudy, I think you're part of the Remind, but just in case you're not, there's the information. You can go ahead and get, get in on that. So that's how the next DBQ is going to work. Tonight, we are looking at Unit 5 and 6. And I got to tell you guys, Unit 5 and 6 is just packed full of stuff. I tried really hard to cut it down and really give you the information that you needed but it still ended up being like six pages. So um, if we get to a point where you all want to just do unit five tonight and do unit six tomorrow or something like that, then we possibly, you know, we could do that. I'm not doing anything tomorrow night, you know, Friday night in quarantine. So <laughs> just staying home, you know? Uh, so if we can't get it done tonight, we can, we can do it tomorrow. But if you guys want to just power through, I am for that as well. So I'll get going here in just a minute. Hey, Tammy, you haven't missed anything yet, really. Uh, the only thing that I went over is that the Remind is right down here in the ticker. If you have not gotten on the Remind, go ahead and do that. And then um, uh, tomorrow we're doing the Jeopardy competition at 12 p.m., so don't forget to log on for that. That's going to be awesome, and we're going to win it, right? And uh, also, the 19th is the last practice DBQ. What I'm going to do is type it up on Saturday, send you guys out a link in the Remind so that you can sit down, write it in 45 minutes, and then I'm going to also put a link in that DBQ that you can submit your work so that I can look over it before Tuesday, and then we'll go over it and we'll talk about everybody's DBQs in the live on Tuesday. So Tuesday, when we actually do the DBQ, we won't be writing it in the YouTube uh, live. We'll be talking about it and I'll give you some feedback. All right. Lou says power through. Okay, baby. All right, let's go then. Uh, Carol says, Missy, I emailed you DBQ. Yes. Um, I am still doing that, Carol. I saw it come in. I just didn't have time to get to it today, but I will check it out tomorrow, hopefully, or Saturday. 
one of those two, and I'll get it back to you. I promise. Okay, so let's get going. We're going to do context for Unit 5. Now, remember, context and um, outside evidence can be used interchangeably, but I'm giving you it separate so that you have a little bit of, you know, separation when you're doing it. Hey, Isabella, make sure that you are part of the Remind. The information is coming up right here. Oh, hold on, right here. Um, because I'm going to be sending out the next DBQ in the Remind. So if you want to practice that, it will be important for you to be a part of the Remind. Okay, let's go with context, uh, Unit 5. Before we do that, though, the time frame for this unit, for these both of these units, is 1750 to 1900. 1750 to 1900. And uh, Unit 5 is all about political revolutions and industrial revolutions. So put Unit 5, industrial revolutions, political revolution. Actually, politicals come first. So political revolution, industrial revolution. That's the topics of Unit 5. Whoop, doop, doop, doop. Hi, Ashley. Welcome back. Haven't seen you for a little while. Welcome in. Uh, if you have not joined the Remind, here's the information, and that's how I'm going to send out the next practice DBQ, so if you're interested in that, you might want to do that. All right, so context for Unit 5, more global trade is happening, so global trade picks up in the 1700s. Remember, the previous unit we were talking about was exploration and the start of all of that, now it's really going to pick up here. We also have Protestant Reformation. So that starts to question the validity of the church. Is the church dependable? Now, also keep in mind that the church was one of the ways that they legitimized their power in Europe. Remember, divine right of kings. So now the Protestant Reformation is going to have them start questioning the church, which will question the validity of kings, right? So Protestant Reformation questions the validity of the church. No problem, Ashley. You're welcome anytime. Just good to see you, kiddo. Yeah, so, Cloudy, at this time, there's no separation between the church and the state. Not yet. Okay, um, then we also have scientific revolution. That starts to question religion as well. So, Protestant Reformation and scientific reformation both are putting doubts in people's minds about, is this really the way we should be governed? Then we have the Enlightenment, which brings new ideas. One of those is the one that Cloudy just mentioned about the separation of church and state. But put down, Enlightenment brings new ideas about government. The Enlightenment brings new ideas about government, which is going to lead to the political revolutions. Now, because you're always going to need examples, here are a couple of examples that you can remember. John Locke, he's associated with the um, unalienable rights or the rights that you're born with. And we also have Voltaire. Uh, 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 and he is uh, the separation of church and state. Now, there are several others. I'm only going to give you two because you won't need all the other ones. Oh, he's also uh, freedom of speech, Voltaire. And, of course, if you know any of the other ones off the top of your head, that's fine, too. But remember, in context, you only need a couple of examples anyway so, you know, that's why I'm only giving you a couple examples. Yes, Cloudy. John Locke is also on uh, natural rights. And uh, what else did you say? Oh, yeah. Um, social contract. Yeah. Social contract is interesting um, because that means that we give up some of our freedoms for protection from the government, right? So that's like laws, like speed limits and things like that. But what's interesting is what we're going through right now with the quarantine and, you know, this big debate, should the government make us wear masks? And people are getting all up in arms about that because we're free. We shouldn't have to wear masks, right? 
but it's kind of a part of this social contract because we're wearing masks to protect ourselves, or at least that's what the government is claiming. So do you give up your freedom a little bit to stay safe? I had a big debate uh, with someone on Facebook about this because they didn't understand social contracts. So, you know, I had to take them to school. And they also thought that unalienable rights were in the Constitution. No, no, my friend, they are in the Declaration of Independence. So one of my friends mistakenly posted the Declaration of Independence and called it the Constitution. Big mistake to be friends with a history teacher and do that. You know what I'm saying? So I kindly corrected her, you know, so that I didn't make her look too, you know, crazy. Um, but she was kind of like, well, you know, I, don't, I didn't know, you know, I'm not a historian. I get it. I totally understand. But make sure that you remember unalienable rights are not in our Constitution. They are protected, though, in the Bill of Rights. They're not called unalienable rights, though, in the Constitution. That's the Declaration of Independence. Okay. Um, Montesquieu lose. Um, I can't remember exactly what he was about. Look that up and let me know because I can't remember off the top of my head. But he was one of the other thinkers during the Enlightenment. Um, popular sovereignty. Yes, definitely an idea during the uh, Enlightenment, Ashley. Good. Claudia says, why would people make that argument? Listen, and people are making all kinds of crazy arguments right now, you know, and uh, I, I am more than happy to help them with the historical aspect of it. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate the support. Yep. You got to educate these people. And, you know, I, it's been a long time since uh, we've been in high school. She's about, she's my age. We were in high school together. So I get, you know, that you forget these things. It's not like everybody studies these documents, but I want you guys to remember that it's only an alienable rights in the Declaration of Independence. So don't make that mistake on your DBQ if it were about that. Who knows if it will be, though. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate the support. You guys are like the best cheerleaders. I just love y'all. All right. Montesquieu is separation between. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The branches. That's right, Isabella. Thank you. So Montesquieu is separation between executive, judicial, and legislative branch. That's where we got that from. Uh, limited government is also a part. Yep. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate the support. <laughs> Uh, and let's see, was Hobbes a thinker? Yes, Hobbes was a thinker as well, and an E, you can also put him down. Hobbes was more of a supporter of the monarchy, though. He was opposite John Locke. John Locke was all about, like, you know, democracy more so, and rights, and Hobbes was like, no, 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 we need to have a monarch. So he was opposite. Hey, Gary, welcome in. Good to see you. Um, Adam Smith is definitely important. You can put him down. Yeah, so I, I just put two down because, like I said, if you need to talk about the Enlightenment, this would be enough evidence. I didn't want to give you too much that you had to sift through. But you could definitely talk about Adam Smith. And some of these you might already have in your head. So if you already have them in your head, that's great. Um, <laughs> Rachel says, Brooke, Gary, I literally texted you about it. Jeez, Gary, like she is like having your back and you still forgetting, I tell you. All right. Uh, and Dick Gary says he finished his second DBQ today. Good job uh, of the day. Oh, you did two of them today. Good. All right. Uh, Tammy says Montesquieu or however you spell his name advocated for the split of government. Very good. Yeah, the different branches. Awesome. So those are just a couple and you got a couple of vocab words in there and um, that's what you're going to need. Okay, so. Before the 1800s, put this down, this is like a new topic, so it doesn't go with the Enlightenment. Before the 1800s, you had um, multi-ethnic empires. So before 1800s, multi-ethnic empires. That switches after the 1800s to more nation states. The nation states are going to have shared cultures, and the big empires will start to break up. Yes, Adam Smith was the capitalism guy. Karl Marx is the communist guy. Yeah, very good. So uh, Carol was just testing y'all. She just wanted to see if you knew what 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 was going on, right, Carol? And uh, we'll get into that here in a little bit. All right. So then another topic that you can put under context is that new tech brings about industrialization. New tech equals industrialization. and more competition. New tech equals industrialization and more competition.
industrialization will then lead to the demand of labor and human migration. So what I would suggest is just write industrialization equals migration and demand for labor or demand for labor and then therefore migration. Which then, draw another equals, leads to imperialism and the need for raw materials. Gary's getting faster at typing, huh? Well, Gary, bring that fast type board tomorrow when we play Jeopardy. Yeah, baby. All right, yes, industrialization, child labor. Yeah, you can put that down as well. We'll get into that in a little bit more details here in a little bit. States expanding. Mm -hmm, that would be good too, Cloudy. All right, so that's some context leading up to unit five, then leading up to unit six, which is imperialism. So put a new topic that says imperialism. Leading up to that, we have the technological change or tech change that increases industry. So tech change equals industry or more industry equals more raw materials. That leads to imperialism. So both of these topics are very easy to do historical context for because it's like a domino effect, okay? Technology changes, then that leads to more industry, then that leads to the need to raw materials, which leads to imperialism. Yeah, what's the WAP Discord? I, I've not heard of that. Is that like a Reddit or something? Okay. Now, uh, also leading up to imperialism, there is an increase in competition between industrialized states. An increase of competition between industrialized states. And then here are some justifications for imperialism. Social Darwinism. White man's burden and this one, I'm going to spell it for you because it's harder to spell. This is the study of skulls and basically they said based on the size of your skull, that's how intelligent or more advanced you were. So those you should know kind of off the top of your head, but just in case you don't, Social Darwinism is kind of like the best race should be in charge. White man's burden is the, the need for the white men to go and help the natives and like bring them into uh, modern society. We know that this is all crap, right? Like this is all poor justifications for what they were actually doing. But these were the things that they were justifying. Yes, Gary, if you had a bigger head, supposedly you are not as smart. It was a smaller skull that was more advanced. And the shape of the skull was really important too. However, that's been proven to be not true. All right, so those are some things that you can use for context. I'm really hoping that you guys get a DBQ from one of these units because context for these two units is super easy. It's just like a domino effect. One thing happens after another. No, no, it's this. So the size of the skull, the smaller the skull and the the narrower it is, I think, is 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 smarter. It doesn't make sense. Right. Because you feel like you should have a bigger skull if your brain is bigger. But that's not the way that they looked at it. Basically, they were like comparing skulls of different ethnicities and they kind of saw that European skulls were this different shape and they were like, oh, well then that must be the best race, right? Because they're just looking for science to prove that they are the smartest. Not the case. Okay, so let's go on. We'll talk about some outside evidence now, okay? So we've got enlightenment. Let's get into that a little bit more. So it comes after the Protestant Reformation and science, uh, scientific reformation. 
We already talked about Jock and Voltaire, or Jock, Locke and Voltaire and all the thinkers, so don't worry about putting anything more down about that. But you can put that it um, applied reason and logic to government. It applied reason and logic to government. And basically they said that individual rights should be more important and government should be limited. I saw it. Did I do it today? I don't think I got to it today, Tasneem. I will get to it tomorrow, though, I promise. But I did see it in my email. I think I've got a couple in there that I need to do. Today was super crazy. I had a lot of meetings and things like that, but I promise you I'll get to it. Okay, so um, this is the first time, too, by the way, the Enlightenment. This is the first time that the king is really questioned. Before this, like, people didn't really question the system, and now they're starting to question that, and they're starting to add more logic. So it's basically now, um, uh, you know, what, what can we do to have more rights? You're welcome, Tasneem. No problem. All right, so Enlightenment leads to, so put, uh, you know, Abbreviate enlightenment equals, it leads to all of this, socialism, feminism, abolitionism, liberalism, capitalism, and more nationalism. So it leads to all of those things. Basically, this new thought process leads to newer thoughts, you know, like how can we make a better government? Yes, all the isms. It leads to all the isms. Very good. It also leads to the revolutions. So make a new bullet point that says enlightenment equals revolutions. Or enlightenment with an arrow that goes to revolutions. The first one we're going to talk about just briefly because you should have most of this one memorized because we're American and you should have been studying this since you were little. Um, but the first one we're going to talk about is the American Revolution. Important document with that, Declaration of Independence, how we talked about before. That's the breakup letter with the king. What's super interesting, if you watched my Explain video, I ran across a book a couple months ago that had letters in it that the colonists wrote to the king years before the revolution asking for more rights. And they were in a completely different tone than the Declaration of Independence. They're more like suck up -y, like, hey, you know, uh, to our royal majesty, we are your loyal subjects. That's not at all how the Declaration of Independence went, right? Because by that time, they were done, so the tone was completely done. Anyway, I was thrilled to find these documents because I knew they existed, but I had never read them before. So maybe this summer I'll throw out another video just about those documents because I think they're, like, super cool. Awesome, Rachel. Thank you so much. Okay, so American Revolution put down Declaration of Independence. Uh, no taxation without representation. That would be good to remember. That basically means, hey, King, you can't tax us unless we have representation in Parliament. But, of course, he wasn't going to give them that. You can also put down, uh, you know, war leads to freedom and leads to constitution. The war leads to freedom, which leads to, consti or, yeah, which leads to a constitution. Okay, uh, then we have the French Revolution. The French Revolution, an important document to remember with that one, is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The problem that was going on in France is that we had three estates. The third estate was the majority but they didn't have as much say in the government. The first and second estate pretty much had all the power. So put down the third estate, didn't have 
any authority, even though they were the majority. Look at that, I'm rhyming. I'm a rapper. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Um, and uh, they also paid the most tax because they didn't have the authority to be able to make decisions. So they had to pay a lot of tax. They were also upset about the extravagant king and queen. You know, we have Marie Antoinette and Louis and this big palace of Versailles. And why do they need all that when we're starving? You know, that was the, the, the big problem that was happening in France. It ends with the beheading of the king and queen. So they get rid of the monarchy. After that is the reign of terror. And then Napoleon comes into power. Okay, Claudia says, society is like a hammer. Anyone who proposes something may influence society, and if society accepts, the hammer is swung at anyone who objects. Kind of, yeah. I mean, and I think it should be more the majority, because if the majority is ruling, then at least you get a say in what you're wanting, right? Even, and if you're not the majority, well, then you didn't get it. Uh, yeah, they tar and feather tax people. That's another uh, thing that happened, absolutely. Uh, ninety-seven percent of the population. Yet, yeah. uh, yet yeah, the third estate was the majority of the people. Good, good, good. The guillotine. Yes, off with your head. <laughs> yes, very good. All right. I do a lesson every year where uh, Marie Antoinette comes back in the time machine. It's one of my favorites. I might have to do a video uh, with Marie Antoinette for you guys so that you can experience it too. Um, but we talk about point of view on that day and. Um, I just, I love Marie Antoinette. She's, she's quite a cool character. Okay. Haitian revolution. Let's move on to that. So after the French revolution, we have the Haitian revolution. Remember Haiti is a colony of France. And when France gets freedom, Haiti's like, wait a minute. Why can't we have freedom? I will try to do it this summer, Ashley. It's quite a process, you know, bringing someone back in the time machine, AKA I dress up, <laughs> but it's still a process, especially with Marie Antoinette. Wan Ying knows, I think you were there Wan Ying when I did Marie Antoinette, um, but uh, it's one of my favorites for sure. You can check out, I have a video of the 1920s. That's, I bring back a, a person from the 1920s in that video. So you might want to check that out. You'll kind of get a little experience of what the time machine is all about. Okay, uh, so um, Haiti wants their freedom. This is led by Toussaint. This is how you spell his name. And the importance of this one is that it is the first slave revolt that worked. Yes, it's the only slave revolt. Good, yes, Ashley. So it's a slave revolt that is successful. I thought we were there, Wang Ying. I was pretty sure. Claudia says, uh, then freedom urge goes to women. Yeah, sure. Yes, I need that is his last name. La, La Overture? I, I don't know. I don't speak French. So it's very, it looks very French to me. I need to learn some French. I tried on Duolingo just a little bit, but I kind of got busy and forgot about it. All right. So then we have the Latin American revolutions. These happen in Mexico. South America and Brazil. Oh, one other thing that you can put with the Haitian Revolution is that it scares other slave owning uh, owners, like uh, it's people who own large slave populations around the world, because they're really worried that it could spread to them. Oh, why? Well, thank you, Gary, for helping with my pronunciation. I was right. La Overture. Okay. Okay, so back to Latin American, Mexico, South America, and Brazil, led by Simone Bolivar. And the gist of this one is that they opposed Spanish mercantilism. Sorry, I cannot talk. They opposed Spanish mercantilism. 
which basically meant that Spain was only allowing them to buy manufactured goods and to trade from Spain. So Spain could set the price however they wanted it to. There was no competition, and they didn't like that. Oh, Gary. Okay, I see. So I shouldn't trust your pronunciation. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, the other problem that we had in Latin America is the different social classes. We talked about those yesterday. And the so different social classes wanted more power for themselves, and they wanted more equality. Of course, the elites didn't really care about equality, but the, um, the lower classes wanted it. All right, we're done with the first page. Woo! <laughs> I was telling them when we first logged in, this is a little longer because there's a lot more stuff in these two units. And I was asking if they wanted to split it up and they were like, no, let's power through. So we're going to keep powering through. All right. These revolutions end with constitutions. They end with constitutions, which will end slavery. But they're still very conservative governments for the most part. They deny voting to some, and women don't really gain any rights. Yes, Luz, uh, the Jamaican letter is a part of this, so you can put that down as a document that goes with this. Yes. Now, if you are comparing the revolutions, Make a little bullet point that says comparing revolutions. One similarity is that they're inspired by enlightenment ideas. That would be one that you could potentially use. Remember, you're going to, if it's, you know, comparing the revolutions, you would have documents to go with this. But here's just some ideas to get you started, just in case that's what this is. Uh, a difference, you could talk about how Haiti is led by slaves. Haiti is led by slaves. France gets rid of the monarch, getting him out of the picture. It's very violent. American, uh, well, and, and the Haitian, they're all violent because they all fight for their freedom. But I'm talking more like violence towards the elite classes. And then America starts their own nation, right? So they're... They're, they break completely free from Britain. And I guess you could say that's a similarity with Haiti and with the Latin American one too. Um, but if you're comparing it with the French Revolution, the, France kind of, they, they get the power from the king, but then when Napoleon takes it back, he's kind of like the king. So that gets a little bit sticky because he actually claims himself emperor eventually. These are just some ideas, though, to get you started. If this is the topic, you're going to want to lean on your documents anyway. Okay, good. So, Cloudy's right. So, France and Haiti is led mostly by the lower class uh, and some of the bourgeoisie, which are the middle class in France. But the American is mostly, like, elite colonist. So, yeah, that would be good to, uh, difference. Okay, new topic. Nationalism rises. Nationalism is rising. Why does it do this? One reason is because the printing press gets information out to the people. The printing press gets information out to the people. Also, there's a decline in religion. Like a decline in the importance of religion. And people start to form an identity around culture. So an identity around culture. For example, we're alike because we speak the same language. That would be a part of culture or your cultural identity. Another reason is because of political upheaval, like all of these revolutions that we we're talking about. Political upheaval. People are no longer as unified.
And around this time, as nationalism is rising, Germany and Italy will unify and become powerful. Germany and Italy unify and become more powerful. And we also have Balkan nationalism. And Greece gets independence from the Ottoman uh, Empire. There are other places in that area that want independence as well. But Greece is the first one. Okay, and then we have the Industrial Revolution beginning. So make a new heading that says Industrial Revolution. It begins in Britain first. Does anybody remember why it begins in Britain first? There are a couple of reasons why it begins in Britain first. Let's see who can type the fastest. Let's see if Gary has fast fingers. <laughs> oh, he was just claiming that he did. Why does it start in Britain first? I'll give you the first one while we're waiting. So they have access to resources such as coal and iron. Ah, there we go. Here they come. Claudia says raw materials. Yeah, so they have access to coal and iron. They have access to water. So good geography. They have uh, canals and rivers that help them travel and transport items. Yeah, good enemy geography, warm water ports, resources from the colonies. Good, Luz. Yes, all of these are accurate. So resources from the colonies, coal and iron, capital, geography helps them. Uh, the government supported trade. That's important. Yes, good job, Luz. The government supports trade. And so the laws are going to reflect that. There's nothing that they want that they couldn't get, okay? Uh, iron ore, timber, natural resources, canals, strong navy, good. Factories, yes. All those are um, acceptable. So that's why it begins in Britain, and then it will spread to the rest of Europe. We also have during this time the agricultural revolution. So make a bullet point that says agricultural revolution makes growing crops more efficient. Agricultural revolution makes growing crops more efficient. This is when we had the switch from cottage industry to factories. If you've recently watched my video about cottage industry, I'm learning how to spin yarn and it has been super fun. Uh, I definitely have been enjoying it. I plan on taking it in and teaching the kids next year. Hopefully, if we get to go back to campus. If not, we just might have to have some YouTube videos, but then they won't really be able to try them. So anyway, it was super fun, and I really, really enjoy it. But that would be a cottage industry. So you can put down for an example of that spinning yarn. Basically, cottage industry is anything that they wanted they made in the home so they made it on their own and then when it goes into the factory things are going to change there are definite benefits with cottage industry as well as negatives and vice versa all right so for example benefit with cottage industry it's going to be better made whereas in the factory it's made quicker and so it's not as good quality most of the time all right uh, water wheel and spinning jenny. Yeah, so the water wheel and spinning jenny, Gary, will help with the, the switch over. That's kind of like the start of like going from the spinning wheel to going to the spinning jenny, which is more productive. Uh, Gary says, I can't take this anymore. What are you talking about, Gary? I don't know. Uh, Cloudy says, or something else. Uh, didn't crop rotations happen? Yes, so crop rotations and any you can put here. Also put the enclosure movement. Enclosure, uh, I if I can spell it right. Enclosure movement uh, happens, which spurs on the factories. 
Oh, I see what you're talking about, Gary. Yeah, I know. I feel you. I miss being in school a lot. All right. So the enclosure movement was basically the um, all the farmers are buying up the small farms so that they can enclose it into a big farm. Now that they have the seed drill and all of these innovations with the agricultural revolution, they can farm faster so they can have more land. Well, then the small farms that are being sold, those people have to look for jobs. So they urbanize and they go to the factories. That's the gist of the enclosure movement. Okay, also under this, you can put new tech. So we already had the spinning jenny was one of them that was mentioned. So we have the spinning jenny. We also have interchangeable parts. Interchangeable parts. There you go. Interchangeable parts basically means that under cottage industry, if we made this pen, we would make each part a part at a time. We put it together. And then let's say something breaks on this pen. I have to just get rid of it. I can't ever fix it really. Like it's, it's not easily fixed because the parts aren't all the same. However, when interchangeable parts come along, this one's kind of gross because it's on my chalkboard. But when interchangeable parts come along, now I have both these pens. They're alike except for color, right? And so if one part breaks on one, I can grab a part that I've already made because it's the same shape and size and it fits on there. Okay. So interchangeable parts makes things more efficient because now it's easier, you know, if something breaks on your um, seed drill. Now you can get a part to fix it before you would have to go back to the drawing board because there were no molds or anything like that. Okay. So that's interchangeable parts. Uh, we also have division of labor and the specialization of labor. Division of labor and the specialization of labor. These are some words that you can throw in to kind of beef up your argument. Uh, and he says these are all innovations of the first, yeah, so uh, first industrial revolution, yeah. And, you know, I don't really think that you're going to have to know the difference between the first and the second, but... I threw some stuff in here in just a minute that will help you with that. Okay, so put down um, that um, uh, Belgium and German, Belgium and German, they follow the British model. So they kind of take the ideas from Britain. Yes, the assembly line will happen eventually. You can throw that in here as well. That happens a little bit later, but you can put that in as an example. Um, it's put down that it develops slower in France because of political turmoil develops slower in France because of political turmoil. Russia, it develops slow because they're mostly an agrarian, uh, society. In Japan, it happens because the U.S. brings it in with the Meiji Restoration. So in Japan, it happens because the U.S. brings it in because of the Meiji Restoration. It's not really supported in China. So put down, China doesn't support it. At first, they were closed door. Then they had, you know, opium wars, boxer rebellion. That was where they were kicking out the foreigners. Basically, the elites didn't support industrialization. Now, also remember that Asia and Africa are going to be places where they're going to get raw materials. So for the most part, in a lot of places in Asia and Africa, there wasn't really a lot of manufacturing because they were going in imperializing, getting these raw materials and taking it back to their home countries to manufacture. So you can say something like along the lines of um, uh, in Asia and Africa, it was mo uh, they didn't have a lot of manufacturing. 
Yes, Wan Yang, you are accurate. The Dowager did not like it. Dow Dowager. And you know what? I was going to bring her in with the time machine. And we didn't get to do it because of this stupid quarantine. Maybe I'll have to bring her in a video too. She's pretty amazing. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can also put down that uh, textiles are coming from Egypt and India. Textiles are coming from Egypt and India. Hey there, welcome back. Glad to have you. Remind me of your name again. Dancer with talent. <laughs> I can't remember your name. Remind me. But welcome back. We're happy to have you. Okay, and then also put down um, that uh, industry will decrease in India because of the British relationship with them. where the British are trying to maintain their control and suppress uh, uprisings. Hey Alexa, welcome back. Gary remembered you. Oh Gary, ever the ladies man. Better watch it, better make sure Rachel doesn't see you. <laughs> Yes, the Sepoy Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so the British were already there, but they're going to take more control throughout the time that they're there. All right, real quick. First Industrial Revolution is 1760 to 1840. You can just jot that down real quick. The first, and what happens there is coal, Iron, rivers are important because of steam engines. You can also put down U.S. builds transcontinental railroad. The U.S. builds transcontinental railroad. Transcontinental, of course, means going the whole way, the transcontinent. And then your second Industrial Revolution is 1870 to 1914. And that's when we have steel, which is a vocab word that you want to remember with steel is the Bessemer process. Also oil, electricity, Radio and telephone. Uh, Lou says, wouldn't India and Egypt produce textiles later after the American Civil War? Yeah, so they're, they always produce textiles, but um, at, because of the American Civil War, Britain will start to depend on them more for cotton because they can't get it from America as much. So, yeah, you're on point with that. We got a lot of Cali people in here. That's cool. Awesome. Uh, Trans Siberian Railroad. Yeah. So that one would be in Russia. And that is going to go across the, um, the Russian territory. Gary, Nebraska. <laughs> Nebraska is a nice state. Have you ever been there? I've never been there, but one of my friends is from there. Yes, Wan Ying. Telegraph. You can put that down there too. Uh, the second revolution, sure, I'll repeat it for you. So uh, steel, which goes with the Bessemer Project, oil, electricity, radio, telephone, and you can also throw in the telegraph. What's even in Nebraska? Mm. Omaha. Omaha's in Nebraska. <laughs> I, I've heard they have a really great zoo. I don't, I don't know. Uh, 
I'll have to ask my friend. She she says Nebraska is the best state, Gary. So I don't know. I think she's a little biased, though. Okay. Uh, so government's role in the industrial revolution. Make a bullet point for that. The government's role in, in industrial revolution. So there's two different ways that they can control. The first one is indirect control. And that one is where um, there's very little government involvement. But they have policies such as patents for businesses. Patents. Let me spell that for you in case you can't tell what I'm saying. Patent. This basically protects an invention, keeps someone else from being able to make that invention. Subsidies and free market. Those are some other indirect controls of government. This is mostly how Europe and the U.S. do it. And then you also have direct control. Example of direct control um, where like Russia is kind of forcing this to keep up with the Western world. So they're, the government is very heavily involved as they're trying to force industrialization. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, that one was definitely spurred on by the government but the elites didn't really support it. And the last one would be Japan, which is the Meiji Restoration. This one, remember the samurai fought against it and they didn't really want it. So there, there wasn't a lot of support there at first either. It was pushed through by the government. Yes, Cloudy, state sponsored. Absolutely. All right, so how did the Industrial Revolution impact society? We're going to go over this really quickly because I think you probably know most of these things already. So Industrial Revolution impacts society or changes society. That's another word that you could use for impact. So if you see that in your prompt, let that spur your memory. Change, okay? Impact. All right, so urban living. We have the growth of cities. They're cramped, dirty mostly tenement or apartment living, increased crime and disease, and uh, long working hours. Yeah, Luz, I would say China would be more direct in some aspects, but indirect in others because, well, they they didn't really industrialize in the same way. Theirs was more of like an enforcement of like westernization and they didn't have as much industry. So, um, and that was mostly because the elite didn't accept it or want, want it. So it was mostly direct in that Sometimes the government was pushing for it, but sometimes they weren't. So, yeah, you could make that argument. Okay, also long working hours. Now, there were long working hours on the farm as well, but it's not as stringent and strict as it is in the factories. In the factories, you're going to have, like, a, a boss breathing down your neck, whereas on the farm, you're more your own boss. Changes in labor. So lower class women and children working under bad conditions. Lower class women and children working under bad conditions. Also we have the rise of the middle class. We start to see white collar workers versus blue collar workers. So we start to get like bankers and lawyers and People that aren't necessarily elite nobles, but they still have good service jobs. Also, consumerism is on the rise. This is really the first time that people have extra money that they can just buy things they want. Kind of like the early form of Amazon. <laughs> And 
uh, banking starts getting going. Banking. We also have changes in transportation. Changes in transportation. That would include trains and steamships. Now you'll have access to places you didn't have access to before. You can travel more, move around a little bit more. This will increase long distance migration. Industrial revolution impacts the economy. So put IR, impact on economy or changes in economy or however you want to write it. Yes, steam engines will bring about locomotives. Yes. Uh, okay, where's this at? Okay, so capitalism replaces mercantilism. Capitalism replaces mercantilism. We also see the formation of monopolies. Insurance. And mass production. Formation of monopolies, insurance, and mass production. This idea comes about, and I'm going to spell it for you. There you go. And this means that people should be in it for the greater good. So uh, all of society, we, we want what's best for all of society, basically. And this goes with a guy, uh, John Stuart Mill came up with this idea. It was an attempt to fix the problems of society in order to help all people. Another idea that comes about economically is communism. This is spurred on by Karl Marx. And he sees these problems in capitalism and has this dream of a utopian society. Spell that for you. Utopian society, which is basically where everyone is equal. And it's, it's kind of a cool idea if you if you read about it and you think about it like everyone would have what they need there would be no have nots there would be no super super rich everyone just has what they need but the problem with it is people people are the problem because we are too selfish and um when we see that we have what we need sometimes people get lazy and they don't want to work for it and so you see this happen in communist societies and there isn't any motivation to better yourself. And if you're a type of person that needs that motivation, then it's a problem. So um, in theory, communism is kind of cool, but it hasn't ever really worked the way that Marx envisioned it and wanted it to be. Yeah, kind of reminds me of the giver too, Enemy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so... Um, we also have transnational businesses developing, transnationalist, transnational businesses developing, because now communication can go from continent to continent, so it's easier to do that. Markets and um, resources kind of increase during this time, and there's a need for the stock market, so markets are growing. Yes, Cloudy. Capitalist mindset is definitely more greed. And I mean, if you think about it, that's what drives us to work mostly. I don't, I mean, I don't look at teaching as like work really because I, I enjoy it so much. But I probably would like, if it weren't for money, I might only want to do it like three or four days a week instead of five, you know? So um, you just, it gives you something, the motivation to work for it. And if you know that you can't ever make any more money, if you're always going to make this same amount, then that motivation really isn't there. And that's one of the biggest problems. 
Uh, Gary says, you know what, Missy? Communist jokes aren't funny until everyone gets them. Ah, uh, <laughs> you're so funny. I tell you, Gary, you're a hoot. All right. Uh, Isabella says, amazing in writing, but not in practice. Yeah, absolutely, Isabella. I mean, it would be great if, if people weren't people, right? If we didn't need that motivation. Okay, let's go on to reforms. There are a lot of reforms during this time frame. And so make a new heading that says reforms. The first place we're going to go is the Ottoman Empire. We have, remember, the Janissaries. They're the Christian boys that were made into uh, military. The Janissaries, they try to take too much power from the Sultan, so he killed them. So put down uh, Janissaries are massacred by the Sultan. And then the Sultan starts to reorganize the government under what's called the, I want to make sure I spell it right, and I did not, the Tanzimat. He starts to reorganize under the Tanzimat. These are his reforms. He creates secular education system. He codifies the laws and adds new ones. He also passes the Ottoman Reform Edict. And that's basically an update of the legal system so that everyone is ensured justice. An update of the legal system so that everyone is ensured justice. No matter your religion or your ethnicity. The problem with these reforms, Christians thought that it took away their autonomy. Christians thought it took away their autonomy. And Muslims thought that it threatened tradition. Muslims thought it threatened tradition. Woo, there was another sheet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go on to China. What do we got going on in China? There's so much going on in China. China is like interesting during this time period for sure. So we have China, the self-strengthening movement. I think somebody mentioned it before. Uh, self-strengthening, did I spell that right? Uh, I think so, movement. Spelling is definitely not my... Uh, Favorite thing, that's for sure. Okay, so the self strengthening movement is 1861 to 1895. And it's an attempt, an attempt, sorry, to solve China's problems. It's an attempt to solve China's problems. So I think somebody asked earlier if this would have been direct rule. Yes, this, this part, this chunk would have been direct because this was the government of China trying to do this. Uh, they build up the military with the help of outside help. So the Western world is kind of helping them. And they reform the tax system. We have four pages left, Rachel. Four pages. We can do it. Okay, they abolish the civil service exam. They establish a Western style industry and medicine. The Empress, I think, I think you pronounce this Gigi. I think I'm pronouncing it right, Gigi. Wang Ying, let me know if that's not right. Uh, she's my she's my resident Chinese pronunciation help. I appreciate her very much. Um, she hijacks the throne from the emperor and stops these reforms. She's very conservative. She doesn't want them to happen. So she stops these reforms. 
She brings back the civil service exam, but then later realizes that it's corrupt, so she gets rid of it. She also supports the Boxer Rebellion, which kicks foreigners out. Tammy, we'll talk about the Young Turks here in a minute. I see your comment. Just a sec. And what's interesting about the Boxer Rebellion, I just learned this the other day, but some of the boxers who were involved in that rebellion were actually mixed Chinese and Africans. And there were black Chinese people, which I thought was super interesting because we never talk about it in class. Uh, I, I didn't even know that that was the case. But if you look up boxers and you look at their pictures, you can tell that they are darker mixed people. And it's just an interesting like little tidbit that I think is really important that we talk about because oftentimes world history kind of becomes like, oh, what are the Europeans doing? And the Europeans are so great. And I, I know when I learned about it in school, it was mostly about European history. But all the other like diversity is so interesting to me. So that's something that you can just put in the back of your head to research a little bit later. I'll try to make a video on it eventually because I haven't even had time to research it. But when I saw the pictures, it was very obvious that that was true. How did Africans get into China? Good question, Cloudy. We definitely need to figure that out, right? There was a lot of migration for sure, and we know that they took slaves from Africa to India. So it could be a possibility that they came up through that way. I'm not exactly sure on that because I haven't had time to, to research it. I just learned about this the other day, and I just thought it was really interesting. So good question, Cloudy. We're going to have to get to that. Uh, and Anise says, I didn't know about the Boxer Rebellion. Well, now you know. Now you know. Basically, Boxer Rebellion was to get the foreigners out. One Ying, it was not in the WAP textbook that I read. Did it, is it in the WAP textbook? Really? Like, did you read about it in the WAP textbook? Because I must have missed that if that was the case. Let me know if you read about it. Because if you did, as soon as we're done with this video, I'm going to go look it up. It was. Okay. Good. I'm glad that they put it in there. I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, I must have missed it. Maybe it was like an excerpt or something that I, I didn't see. Do you remember where or how they got to Africa or how Africans got to China? Do you remember reading about that? Let us know if you can give us any information about that. Okay. Uh, also, China accepts help from the West because Japan is trying to come in and take over and take territory. So China says, okay, we'll start to accept help because we want to keep Japan out. Okay, Wanyin, no problem. That may be why I missed it. Maybe it was like, like a little excerpt box or something. And then put down that by 1911, China becomes a republic. That could be a possibility, Indian Ocean trade route. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, there's so much in world history that's amazing stuff, but we just don't have time to get to it. I wish, like Gary was talking about the other day, I wish it was like in two different classes. That'd be really great. Okay, let's talk about real quick continuities and changes during this time frame. So we, continuities, we have the class structures are very rigid. Rigid class structures based on economical status and ethnicity. That is a continuity that you could for sure use. You can also put down rivalries among nations. Everybody's trying to be the best. Gary, you're into the ancient stuff, huh? You would, oh my goodness, you would have loved it this year. We had the world's leader in Mesopotamian cuneiform come to our school through this organization called Archaeology Now. His name is Dr. Finkel. He works for the British Museum. I need to try to get him on my YouTube channel. I'm going to work on that because he is the most, he's just the coolest guy. Like I could listen to him talk all day. He's just 
got he knows the coolest information. But he can read Mesopotamian cuneiform like we can read English. Like so, he's so cool. He's so cool. He came to our school this year. It was like the best. I should have videotaped it, and I didn't because like I was busy like manning the door. We did it at lunchtime, and so you know you kind of had to keep the kids quiet and stuff like that. And I just didn't have time. But he is phenomenal. I'll I'll try to get him to guest guest star because he's just he's awesome. Yeah, Isabella, wasn't that the coolest thing? Yes, it was one of the extra credit lunch events. Yeah, I just, that was like the best day of this year. I just love that guy. Which reminds me, I need to send out his thank you card that I've had forever and I didn't send it out yet. Okay, changes, industrial production and consumption of goods. So that definitely rises, okay? Industrial production and consumption of goods rises. Uh, thanks, Anani. I try. So my job at um, my school is a little bit different. I teach one class of AP World History, and then I run the library the rest of the day. So what's cool about that is that all the time machine stuff that I do, I can have all the history classes come down to the library, and everybody gets to be in my class. So it's kind of like I teach all the classes, kind of, in, in, a, in, a, in a fun way. And so um, that's why I get to do fun presentations like that. Yeah, I know. It was only a few months ago, Wang Ying, but it feels like so long ago. Yes, Success Blueprint, you're right. The bicycle fad of the 1880s. If you've seen the bicycles of the 1880s, they're super funny looking. I think they would be extremely hard to ride, but um, they're, they're really interesting. All right, also put down for changes, new sources of raw materials. So they're starting to branch out and find that we can get all these different raw materials from all over the place. Yes, Ashley. Yeah, I, I'm a librarian too. It was kind of crazy. Our librarian left and my principal was like, hey, you might be kind of good in that role. Do you think you'd like to do that? And I was like, if I can do my time machine stuff. And so it just really worked out. Uh, we also have another change, capitalism and communism. So that kind of becomes a thing, capitalism and communism. Expansion of the middle class. Women and children in factories. Voting rights start to be demanded. Eventually in the 1900s is when we'll see more women asking for voting rights. And social reforms and labor unions. Gary, I see, yeah, I see your point. I mean, it, ancient history is definitely uh, interesting. I don't know that it's more interesting than the modern stuff. I've always enjoyed teaching the modern stuff a little bit more, but that's because we get to spend more time on the modern stuff. I do love talking about Cleopatra, though. So I'll, I'll try to make some videos over the summer, you know, in all my spare time. I'm probably going to be teaching summer school, so I don't know how fast I'll get those done. But stay tuned. And I'll, I'll try to work on Cleopatra. She is awesome. I love telling her story. And I can bring her back in the time machine, too. Okay. Uh, so next we're going to talk about imperialism. So make a bullet point for imperialism. Blueprint says, I don't know, I kind of like more modern history because you can trace it to our society today and understand what historically led to today's cultures. That's true. That is true. But it is interesting how history kind of repeats itself. That part is kind of interesting. All right, let's go with the motives of imperialism. First motive, a nationalistic motive. Nationalistic motive. Countries are looking to uh, identify themselves on a global scale. They want to be the best in the world. So we see Britain going into South Asia. France to West Africa, and Japan to, uh, to East Asia. Remember, Japan is getting in on this because they are industrialized, so they need the raw materials too. We also have some religious motives. Christian missionaries are going in to civilize. 
Christian missionaries are going in to civilize. In parentheses, you can write this guy, Livingstone. His first name is David. Have you ever heard the saying, Dr. Livingston, I presume? That is after him. And basically, he, he's got a really cool story. He went into Africa and no one heard from him for a long, long time. And they sent out kind of a search party. I can't remember the guy who went out and searched for him. But he eventually found him. And then he supposedly said, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Like, are you the one? So anyway, you might hear that sometimes. Uh, they use that saying a lot. Uh, I do not do a push. Um, I have been asked <laughs> to do it. Um, but I will help with tutorials and stuff, as Wang Ying says. And I will definitely help like DBQ kind of stuff. Uh, I would like to get into a push videos. It's just the time factor right now. And since I don't teach it, I don't know the curriculum as well. So it would be a little bit harder for me to do that. Um, but since I'm starting to build a following, you just never know. You never know. I might try to fit it in next year. We'll see how it goes. Um, okay, so Invictus says gold, God, and glory. Yeah, it's kind of like that same thing. Money always drives people power always drives people and religion. So just remember those things. Uh, Lou says, can you repeat? Okay, so uh, religious motives was uh, Christian missionaries looking to civilize. Let me know if you need the countries repeated, Lou, and I will help you with that. Uh, Blueprint says, just to make sure we're slaves brought to the Americas, baptized or converted to Christianity. Yes, usually they were. Um, and uh, that is why, you know, there's such a strong um, tie to religion during that time. And you hear a lot of slave songs that are like, uh, you know, the Moses one and uh, all about Bible and like setting the captives free. And actually religion was used a lot with keeping slaves in their place and saying, you know, you need to obey your master because this is what God wanted you to do. So, yeah, that's an important part. Okay, so Luz, uh, Britain to South Asia, France, West Africa, Japan, East Asia. Yeah, Tammy, I'm not promising anything, but I will definitely try to help you guys because I, I, love, I love helping you all. But um, sometimes, especially at the end of the year, it just gets crazy busy. But this summer, I do have some plans to at least try to like make a review unit for a push for the end of the year. Cause I've already started on it and I just haven't finished it. So at least there would be that for you guys. So just, uh, you know, stay subscribed and I'll, I'll help you out as much as I can. Plus you've got my email so I can help you through the year if needed. Uh, syncretic cultures. Yes. Um, uh, blueprint. Yes. Uh, I thought a lot of slaves blended their religion. That is true, Tammy. That happened, but it depended on where they were, okay? So, like, it depends on what um, culture they're around. Santeria and voodoo mostly happens in the south and in the islands, and then you're going to have more, like, Christian aspects, like uh, fundamental Baptists would be more in the south. So it just kind of depends on, on where um, they were at. Okay. Yes, Wan Ying. Yes, we need to do more crafts for sure. Uh, I would like to do some more videos on that kind of stuff too. All right, we got to get going. <sighs> here we go. Buckle down. All right. Um, I'd love to just sit here and talk to y'all. Don't get me wrong because y'all are fun, but <laughs> we got to get going. So uh, many, uh, let's see, uh, we're, if, if we're religious motivation. So they did bring some benefits with them. They brought education, medicine, and oftentimes they ended the slave trade where they were at. So if they're going into parts of Africa that still have remnants of the slave trade, the missionaries are going to bring an end to that. Now, the ironic part is that in some places, the people were still treated poorly, almost as though they were slaves. It just wasn't called slaves. But missionaries were claiming, hey, we're taking all these good things in. We're benefiting you. Then we have some economical motivations. Um, once again, nationalists would be like 
glory and then God would be religion and economic would be like gold. So Gary, you hit it on the head there. Just remember that and you've got this. Uh, so economically, we have uh, joint stock companies like the East Indian Company. And they're looking to maximize pro profits. So joint stock companies like East India Company, just put like EIC if you can remember that, looks to maximize profits. We have treaties that are signed to set up trading post in the area. Treaties that are signed to set up trading post in the area. The desire for raw materials. Here's some examples. In Latin America, we have rubber coming from Brazil. Copper from Chile. And banana republics. Not the store. <laughs> banana republics would be mostly export economies, like exporting cash crops. In Africa, we have cotton coming from Egypt. Palm oil from West Africa. Yes, good, Cloudy. Gano from Peru. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's more, but once again, I'm just trying to narrow down some of your choices, just give you some topics. Fertilizer, yeah. Bird poo, <laughs> I like it. Gano, bird poo, fertilizer, yes, got you. Uh, examples of the treaties. I don't really have a specific example of that. I would just simply say that like treaties were made with African tribes to go in and like have some of their areas. I don't really know one off the top of my head. You could look one up though, probably. There might be some in the book. That's interesting. Uh, Blueprints. Pure, uh, Peru sold 10 million euros of Gano. Huh. That's amazing. Okay. Um, also, we have uh, new markets to sell finished goods. So this is another economic um, motivation is to go into these places and sell their goods. Okay. So new markets to sell goods. Well, Wan Ying, we're already on the next unit. So it'll be like a, a three pager instead of a one pager. <laughs> All right. Um, and then economically also, they're taking advantage of coerced labor. Taking advantage of coerced labor. One example of that would be the Congo. King Leopold is using those people very harshly, basically slavery. I mean, it's the same thing probably even worse. The way that he treated those people was just awful. Gary says, Europeans be like, sir, I'm going to need your poo. <laughs> That's funny. Gary's a comedian. All right, new topic. The process of new imperialism begins. The process of new imperialism begins. Done with that page, woo! <laughs> it make, it's so celebratory doing that, you know? It just makes it, it makes it feel like we've accomplished more. All right, so new imperialism is that states strengthen their control or assume direct control over colonies where no states existed. So new imperialism is, is basically just strengthening their control over colonies that they already had or taking over new places that don't have a state. We have three pages, three pages left. But I kind of space these pages out a little bit different, so it's almost like two. At least that's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Whatever, Gary, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so going on, here's some examples. So King Leopold of Belgium, we already talked about him. 
Um, the British, British India uh, sets up the Raj. The Raj is spelled like this, pretty much how it sounds. And that's basically uh, the government of Brit of of Britain of Britain, sorry, going into India and taking orders from the British government and then giving it to India. So it's the British government and India. It was a long explanation for what it means. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Then make a new poll point that says states are going to use warfare and diplomacy to expand. States will use warfare and diplomacy to expand. Examples of use of warfare would be Gambia and Lagos in British West Africa. Gambia and Lagos in British West Africa. And uh, treaties were used in Nigeria. There's an example for you. Ashley, treaties are used in Nigeria to develop British uh, control there. And then we also have the Berlin Conference. That takes place because there was so much spreading out that there were European countries that were going to probably start to argue about territory. So they decided to get together, do the Berlin Conference so that they can divide everything up. The problem is no Africans are present. So make sure that you remember that part. No Africans are present in the Berlin Conference. So when they divide Africa up, they don't really take into account that some of these tribes had been fighting for years and that they were really big enemies of each other. And so they're putting these enemies together in the same nation. That's not going to work. It'll eventually lead to things like the Rwanda genocide. Yeah, Tammy. So smuggling, definitely um, popular, just like any crime would be popular because they could get away with it a little bit easier sometimes because there wasn't uh, as much wall in some of these places. And where there was law, it was kind of hard to monitor. Piracy is really, really interesting. I can't remember when the golden age of piracy was. I think it was a little bit earlier. It would have probably been like the 17th century, maybe, maybe 18th century. Um, but definitely uh, that's an interesting topic as well that we don't really get into very much. But, um, you know, especially piracy and out on the sea, if you had a better ship, then you could destroy your enemy because there wasn't anybody that was going to come to their rescue. Yes, Wanying, the Hutu and the Tutsi. So the Hutu and the Tutsi were enemies, and that was disregarded when they divided up that area in the Berlin Conference, and it leads to all kinds of things. Ah, oh, thank you, Gary. 1650 to 1720. I was on point with that. Golden Age of Piracy. I like pirates and pirate history. Okay, uh, so we also have uh, the French establish a settlement colony in Algeria. So put French equals settlement colony in Algeria. Settlement colony is just meaning that they take settlers there. The British had penal colonies. Here's how you spell that. Penal colonies in Australia and New Zealand. So that's where they sent criminals that they didn't have room for in Britain. United States uh, is expanding through Manifest Destiny. You'll learn a lot about this next year, Manifest Destiny, which is basically uh, meaning that their destiny was to go all the way to the West Coast. And they're going to do that at any cost. They start by removing the Cherokee in the Indian Removal Act. Okay. 
and they send them on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. Definitely a very dark time in our history for sure. The really crazy thing about the Cherokee is that the Cherokee had assimilated to British culture and they had changed their language and not, and not British, American, sorry. Um, which is kind of British in a way, but by this time we were free. So the Cherokee had um, assimilated to American culture and they had changed their ways. They settled down, they started farming, they changed how they dress, their language, everything. And they were told that they'd be able to keep their land because of that assimilation. But in the end, because their land was wanted by colonists, they were still kicked out. So very, very sad time. Also, uh, the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine is the message of the U.S. to tell the uh, Europeans to stay out of the business of what was going on over on our side of the world. And then he says, could you relate the Monroe Doctrine to the Declaration of Independence? Um, possibly, but I think that would be difficult. Kind of, uh, uh, I don't know. Tell me what you're thinking. We'll see what you we'll see what you come up with. Uh, we also have the Spanish American War. We talked about the oh no we didn't talk about this yet. Spanish American War um, over the Philippines. We talked about this in Jeopardy. That's what I'm thinking. We had a question about this in our last Jeopardy game. So Spanish American War. Spanish and Americans fight over um, imperialism in the Philippines, and in the end, the U.S. gets the Philippines. The Philippines want to be free, so they fight against the U.S. They don't get free until 1946. 1946. The French established a settlement colony in Algeria. Tammy. Okay, let's move on to Russia. Russia goes into Eastern Europe. They also go into Alaska. And they take over parts of Afghanistan. That was called the Great Game, where they're trying to get more territory in Afghanistan. Oh, I see an enemy. No, all of Europe, not just Britain. Gotcha. All right, then we have Japan. Japan uh, has the Colonization Society. And that's uh, sending colonists to places like Mexico, Hawaii. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go anywhere, I want to go to Hawaii and Latin America. Although they were going there to work on the pineapple farms and stuff like that, so, or the pineapple plantations. So maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't be so great to be in Hawaii. Ashley says, is it bad that I didn't learn much of this in class? That is a bummer. You know, world history is really hard. Uh, AP world history, that is, because there's so much and um, it's hard to talk about everything in class. So don't feel bad if you didn't learn most of this stuff, because I, I usually make my students depend on reading and then we do more activities in class. It's a little bit less lecture like this. But this is a good setup for YouTube because we can't really do activities the way we would do in class. So my kids probably didn't learn it very much either because they did activities and most of them didn't read. Um, <laughs> so they probably didn't either. And they're supposed to be listening to this for their grade this week. But I don't know if any of them are on here. So we'll see. Maybe they'll listen to it later. Uh, we'll see. Okay, uh, now we also have a new topic, Indigenous People Resist. Indigenous People Resist. Keep in mind, Indigenous just means Native. It's a fancy word for that. College Word likes to throw those big words at you, but don't be scared. Indigenous just means Natives, okay? So put a, a bullet point for that. Indigenous People Resist State Expansion. Here's some examples in Africa. We have the Sokoto Caliphate. This is West Africa. 
and it happens in 1903 that the British finally uh, take over after fighting with this caliphate. We also have the Zulu Kingdom. This is in South Africa. If you have time to watch the Germs, Guns, and Steel theory, uh, the second one is about what we talked about with exploration. That's super interesting. And then the third one is about the Zulu Kingdom. So definitely uh, check that out. And the British won, basically they won here because of better technology. The Zulu were mostly still fighting with all their old weapons and they couldn't compete with the British cannons and new technology. We also have the one that was just mentioned in the comments, Torre, Samory Torre, I think is how you pronounce his name. He fights the French in West Africa. He is captured though after several years of fighting and exiled. Ah, we got a lot going on over here. Good job, Cloudy. Yes, the uh, host of cattle killing, the ghost dance, these ding-dang white men with their ding-dang Maxim guns. Yes, the Maxim guns. Absolutely. Maxim guns were cr crazy deadly. So we have the host of cattle killing, which Cloudy uh, reminded us of. Of, thank you very much. Cattle killing. And this is in South Africa. Unfortunately, this did not drive out the ding dang white men, as Gary calls them. It, um, in fact, causes famine because not only do they kill their cattle, but they also burn their crops. The goal here was to get rid of the white men, but that doesn't happen. And last but not least in Africa is the Boer Wars. This is how you spell it. Oh, it's hard to write on this side. Boer Wars. This is in South Africa. Until I'm right-handed, it's hard to write over there. This is between the Boers, the Afrikaners, who are the Dutch settlers that were there, and the British. And the British were pushing them all out. Eventually, they go into concentration camps, and uh, they are defeated. Yes, Isabella, yes. Unfortunately, it, it fired back on them. Yeah, Ashley, they kind of they kind of wiped themselves out accidentally. Yeah, very sad. All right, then in Peru, we have Tupac. So moving on to South America in Peru, we have Tupac. He is a descendant of the Incas. He fights against the Spanish. Unfortunately, he is captured and killed along with his family. So a lot of these resistance movements end in tragedy. It's very sad. Uh, except for the Mexican Revolution or the Mexican um when they fought against the French involvement, they actually win. So that one had a happy ending for the Mexicans. And as a result, we have Cinco de Mayo, which was not fun this year because I had to make my own tacos at home. Very sad about that. Yes, Tammy, apartheid will come eventually uh, as a result of the Boer Wars and uh, everything that takes place in South Africa. Good point. That is one topic that I'm going to miss teaching this year. I'll just try to make a video about that too. Uh, if you have time, read about, what's his name? Oh my goodness, Nelson Mandela. He is, he's amazing. Like probably one of the most amazing people that ever lived in my opinion. He's so, he's so awesome. All right, uh, oh, now we're gonna move to New Zealand. New Zealand has uh, people that were uh, indigenous people, the Maori or the Maori, this is how you spell it. They fight 
and unfortunately they lose. And then in Australia, we have the Aboriginal people. And they, uh, they're they still around. I was just watching a special about them the other day. But because of the colonies that were set up there, both of these indigenous people are going to suffer a great deal. Uh, so, Cloudy, apartheid, yeah, it's, it's close to Jim Crow laws. It's basically the same as segregation here in our country. Uh, but it, it happened because... They wanted to keep the races separate. And so you had the Afrikaners, which were the white settlers, and they were mostly of Dutch origin, some British mixed in there as well. And then um, on the other side, we had the South African Africans. And uh, Trevor Noah wrote a book. It is awesome, super funny. And it, I'm, I don't think, yeah, he grew up during apartheid. Um, and so that's what made it really interesting to me because he talks a lot about that and like how when he was a kid, what he experienced and stuff. So definitely check that book out. It would be great summer reading. And um, they were separated. Well, what happened was Nelson Mandela wanted to fight against this. And he did. And they imprisoned him for like 20, 25 years. I can't remember the exact number. And when he got out, he was elected president. And the white people were like, oh, crap. Like, this is not good that someone we imprisoned is now president because they thought that he was going to take revenge on them. And instead, he said, no, I'm forgiving. I'm not going to take my revenge. I just want us to move on and unify. And he started working towards unifying the country, which is absolutely amazing, in my opinion. I mean, if someone imprisoned me for that long, it would be very hard to forgive. Not only was he imprisoned, but it was a heavy labor in prison camp. And he lost his family pretty much because his wife was very angry that he had fought against this and got punished for it. It was just a horrible story what he went through, and yet he still forgave. Amazing story. Amazing. There's also a movie called Invictus, which is interesting that that's Gary's handle on here. Check that out this summer as well. It's about Nelson Mandela and what he did to try to unify the country. And Gary says, that's so weird. I always thought that white people were just in Australia and never knew about the Aboriginals. Exactly. Yet yeah, Aboriginals were are actually the oldest continuous culture in the world. Um, I thought that was interesting. And now I can actually connect the accents to the British and the Australians. Yeah. So Australian accent does sound much better. I agree. Um, yeah. Cloudy, definitely. He's he's like one of the best people ever. Um, I just I just love him. I love reading about him. Gary said, I would have taken my revenge. A lot of us would have. A lot of us would have, Gary. I mean, you're probably not the only one um, because it, it would be hard to forgive that. Uh, and then he said, I thought the Afrikaners were the natives. No, uh, they were they were the, uh, the white people that were there. Yeah, until I met AP World History. You know, you always think a lot of things <laughs> until you meet AP World History, right? You learn a lot from this class. Okay, so let's go on. One more uh, rebellion that we need to mention here in South and Southeast Asia. That's the area we're going to go to. We already kind of talked about them. So just put down Sepoy Rebellion. That one you probably mostly have in your brain. That's the one that the Muslims and the Hindus didn't want to rip off the, the capsules of their weapons. They had bullet cap, I can't remember what they're called, but bullet casings, there we go. And um, they were greased around the edges with animal fat. And in order to get the powder out, you had to rip it off and dump it in like that. Well, then the animal fat is going to go in your mouth. And the Muslims and Hindus didn't do that because that was sacred to them. Like they couldn't have the cow and pig fat. Okay. So that's why they rebel in the Sepoy Rebellion. The importance with this Sepoy Rebellion, put this down, is that it starts a push for Indian nationalism. It starts a push for Indian nationalism. Isabella says, I saw that movie and it's amazing. It shows uh, what you can do when you leave your negative feelings aside for the greater good. Yeah, absolutely, Isabella. Totally, totally agree. Uh, then another one, we have the Philippines. They fight against the U.S. They don't get their freedom until 1946. And then um, Vietnam also resists French expansion. Okay, our next topic, 
Ooh, we're almost done with this page. Next topic is the global economy develops further. The global economy develop fur develops further. Here we go. Woo! That's out of here. All right, two more to go. And, and guess what? The last page is just a half a page. All right, jazz hands. Here we go. Technology assists with the amount of trade. So we have new technology that brings about more trade. We've already kind of mentioned that a little bit. Um, we have more cash crops. So put down some examples of cash crops. You can put your, your favorite Gano from Peru and Chile. We have beef from Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. I'll let you write that while I take a drink. We have lamb from New Zealand. And also another problem that happens is monocultures. This happens because farmers are told to only grow certain cash crops and then sometimes they don't have enough food to eat. Wani, well, you're so funny. I don't know why you wait to eat. <laughs> you poor thing. It's like your reward, you know? <laughs> okay, um, so uh, monocultures, the other problem with them other than famine is that it spreads pest quickly. Because if you have acres and acres of the same crop, then pests can just go from one field to the next field to the next field to the next field. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is under global economy. Loose. Uh, also, monocultures causes deforestation and depletion of soil. New topic. We also have... Uh, export economies, export economies develop. Examples of this is that British get cotton from India. And then because of the Civil War, they, uh, well, before the Civil War, they get it from America. And then the Civil War disrupts that. So they turn to get cotton from Egypt. So they're kind of like bouncing around. Okay, Wanyin, you usually eat at eight. Okay. That's cool. I get way hungrier before eight. I, I could never wait. Gary's going to study all day. Okay, Gary, I see you. All right. Um, we also have rubber that is transplanted. It goes from the Amazon to Southeast Asia. So rubber is transplanted from the Amazon to Southeast Asia. Palm oil goes from West Africa to Southeast Asia. So those are some examples of that. All right, let's talk about some changes that economic imperialism brings about. So put a topic for that, economic imperialism brings about change or changes of economic imperialism. China's power and influence is diminished. China's power and influence is diminished. This is where the opium wars are mentioned. You should already know uh, what those are. They basically end with the treaties of Nanking after both war and Hong Kong is given to the British. Uh, let's see. Eventually we have spheres of influence are set up. So the longer that um, domination of other countries goes on in China, the more power they lose. Carrie, you have not done 100 DBQs. Cloudy, he's a little bit exaggeratory. Okay, exaggerating his uh, his ideas here. Okay, we also have the Taiping or the Taiping Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion, which we've mentioned several times. Just know that this is kind of in that same realm of happenings. Um, and 
The Taiping happens because the peasants are starving, but it's shut down by the Qing dynasty. The Boxer Rebellion, of course, was to get the, um, the foreigners out. And then we have the U.S. come in, and the U.S. wants an open-door policy. Basically, they're asking that everyone have the same trading rights. They didn't want Britain to have all the power. Does it help to write it on the board like this so that you've got it? Wanya, you've done more, though, throughout the year. Maybe only one practice one, but... I've got a bunch. I got one for each unit. You can go and do those, Cloudy. <laughs> All right, let's go to Latin America. Next topic, U.S. and Latin America. So the United States goes into Latin America and they start the United Fruit Company. And Banana Republics. Do you remember that song? Dayo, Dayo, Daylight, come and me wanna go home. That's what this is about. Banana Republics. Interesting, huh? It's a cool song. Well, if you listen to the words, though, it's quite sad because it talks about how um, the natives were exploited during this time frame. But the, the beat is really, really cool, right? And it's really catchy. But when you actually sit down and listen to the words, you're like, oh, that's crazy. Well, Invictus, it was way before y'all's time. It's definitely an oldie. Uh, but you should check it out. I think it's like Deo. I think it's called Deo. I think. Gary says, I feel like I hit the points for most of them, but I just like keep doing it. Yeah, it definitely, practice definitely helps. Okay. Uh, we also have corporate investments in Mexico and Cuba. Corporate investments would be like companies investing. I forgot to write that. Corporate investments. Uh, we have the building of the Panama Canal. So you have uh, Central America and then we have South America, that's a really bad rendition. Panama Canal allows ships to go through this area instead of going all the way around South America. Now they can go through, so that definitely helps. Yes, it's Isabella. I love that song, too. Costembol was in Stantinople. I was Costembol. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's very catchy. That one's a little not as sad. Uh, I can tell I'm getting tired. My grammar has gone out the window. <laughs> okay, yeah, Gary. I totally understand. And, uh, okay, oh, this is during the time frame of the Monroe Doctrine as well. So put down uh, Monroe Doctrine with all this stuff. And then we're going to move on quickly to Africa and Asia. Basically, in Africa and Asia, their economic power is compromised and taken away from them little by little. We have food production declining uh, and cash crops instead. So food production declines and it's replaced or it goes to cash crops. And this is Africa and Asia. Europeans come in and take land. Now, this isn't everywhere that this happens, just in the settler colonies. There are some places in Africa that Europeans can't really uh, survive very well because of malaria. 
Eventually, they'll come out with some medicine for malaria, which helps, but this was not in all places. There were specific settler colonies. Uh, and then one-sided trade deals. So Europe uh, makes one-sided trade deals. And basically, that would be like um, giving cheap manufactured goods for raw materials that are worth more. Oh, Carol's got a 12-pager. Okay, Carol. You might want to go through after we're done with this and um, uh, highlight, you know, things that are like key words and things that you want to stand out a little bit. Carol is just writing it all. She's writing it all. She got it. Okay. Um, okay. Where are we at? Uh, da, 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 da. Migration. So we got to go to a migration. We're almost done with this page, though, guys. Here, here we go. Migration through labor systems. This is your new topic. Slavery is mostly abolished by the mid-1800s, but it's replaced with uh, coerced labor. So slavery is abolished by the 1800s. It's replaced with coerced labor. Contract laborers. And we always have had indentured servants. This can result from imperial recruitment, like the British in India uh, recruiting Indians and forcing them to go work on plantations. So you could put down that this could be from imperial recruitment. An example is the British recruiting Indians for plantation work. Uh, beside contract labor, right, China, as an example here, they send contract laborers to plantations in Cuba. Are you guys ready? No, we want you to go away. We don't want you to sit up there. Go away. All right. This is just half a page, guys. We're getting there. We're so close. Okay. Um, penal colonies are also part of this migration for labor. So just put down penal colony. We already talked about what that was, so we won't put any details there. Um, let's see. Uh, so this brings about demographic changes. So demographic changes of labor. Migration. There we go. Demographic changes of labor migration, that's your topic. Here's some things that happen. Let's see. Um, Indians are going into British colonies. Indians are going into British colonies. Yeah, we are almost at two hours. Well, we they wanted to power through, so we're, we're powering through, Gary. Um, British colonies, so, so Indians go into the British colonies of the Caribbean. Fiji, which is spelled like this, Fiji, and South and East Africa. Chinese go to California to help build the railroad. Chinese go to California to help build the railroad. And they go to British Malaya. That's how you spell Malaya. They go to British Malaya to work on farms. Oh, Gary, you're ever the non-concentrator. <laughs> 
Um, all right. Let's talk about push and pull factors or the reason for migration. Reasons for migration. These are push and pull factors, things that push you out or pull you in. These can also be causes. Yes, Rachel, you can put down that they're going for the gold rush as well. Yep. Okay, so push and pull factors. In India, they are leaving extreme poverty. They want to leave extreme poverty or poverty under British rule. So that is pushing them out. China. They're leaving because of overpopulation and the Taiping, the Taiping Rebellion is causing problems. Ireland, the Great Famine happens. They also have political turmoil with Britain. So some of them are fleeing because of that reason. We even have some British people leaving. They are going to help build infrastructure in other parts of the world. Infrastructure builders. I don't know if that's the technical way to put it, but that's how I'm going to word it. We have some settler colonies, British in Argentina. Japan to Mexico, but this one fails. Fail, utter fail. Uh, also, another reason is educational opportunities. An example of this is Japan uh, to the U.S. And then the gold rush. We already mentioned that, but definitely the gold rush uh, pulls people in. Longest live of the year. Yes, Wanya. You know, we got to end the year with a bang, right? We're almost done, though. Not too much longer. Not too much longer. And Wanya can go eat. All right. Uh, migration, social impacts. So how does this impact society? We have um, women taking on new responsibilities. At the home front, because the men are leaving. Guys, I did so much yarn spinning over the weekend that my shoulders hurt, and I'm like trying to write, and it's hurting. Oh, don't get old. Just stay young for as long as you can, because your muscles hurt a lot more when you're old. All right, uh, we have discrimination. Such as the Chinese Exclusion Act. Which limits uh, immigration. In Australia, it was called like white Australia policy. Also, the Irish are discriminated against when they come over. And then some other social impacts. We have the ethnic enclaves. 
This is like Chinatown and Little Italy. We have a Chinatown here in Houston, but I was really disappointed in it because it was it's like a new Chinatown, like everything is new and it just doesn't feel like Chinatown should feel. Like I feel like it should be more historical, you know? Uh, anyway, uh, we also had some ethnic enclaves, uh, Italians going to Argentina. At the time, Argentina really, really liked Europeans coming in. They treated them very well and the living expenses were cheaper there. So Italians could get more for their money. And we also have Chinese going to Peru. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for quoting me. It's true, though. Don't get old. Stay young as long as you can, please. I'm telling you, it sucks getting old. Yesterday's live was an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah, we beat yesterday's record. I guess the APDBQ will come from three, four, or five units because unit one is, and two is so easy. The team, you're probably right. I would probably say, you know, we can't be sure because, you know, that college board, they are always tricking us. Um, but I would say it's going to come from either four, three, four, five, or six. I would say that would be my best guess. And they probably won't have it come from six, actually, because that was the last unit we did. And, you know, they want you to, like, really think. So three, four, or five is probably a good bet. But I have heard that there are several different versions and that it might not be the same question. So we'll see what happens. Um, Wan Ying says, it's just supermarkets. I know, Wan Ying. I was so disappointed. I wanted, like, the cool, like, little Chinatown shops and stuff like that. Tammy, I've never been to a Koreatown. That would be cool. Which Korea town have you been to? All right, guys. Are you ready for this? Ah, last paper. We're done with unit six. Yes. Wan Ying, you can go and eat. You're free. You're free. All right, real quick, before you guys hop off of here, I just want to go through a couple of things. Tomorrow at noon, join on for the Jeopardy competition against Mr. Stopper's class because uh, we got to win. You know that. We got to win. We've been doing all this hard work. We got to win. Um, and so, uh, definitely we got to do that. So that's 12 tomorrow. And then on Saturday, I will send out the unit six DBQ. If you are not in the remind, it's scrolling across the screen right there at the bottom on the ticker. If you are not in the remind, get in the remind. That's how I'm going to send you the link to the DBQ. What I'm then going to do after you have that link, I'll put in the DBQ some directions to remind you of this. But I'll put, a DB, uh, I'll put a link where you can drop your DBQ once you're finished, sit down, set a timer for 45 minutes so that you can replicate what it's going to be like on the actual day. Do that DBQ. Limit yourself to only 45 minutes and then drop it in that Google link. I will look at it on Sunday or Monday and put feedback on it. And then when we go over the DBQ on Tuesday, instead of writing it together like we normally do on the DBQ Lives, what I'll do is go over different parts of your DBQs that you wrote to give feedback and to also talk about things that you can improve on and things like that. Don't worry, though. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to say, oh, Gary, this is what Gary did. No, no, no. I won't do that. Okay. So it'll be all confidential. You will maybe recognize yours, but you won't have to like say, oh, that's mine. Now, knowing Gary, he'll probably say that, but that's okay. Um, okay. So... Uh, I want to see where Koreatown, Rachel says, even though I'm not from your school, you still take time to grade my DBQs. And I want to thank you for that. You are so welcome, Rachel. No problem. I am a complete dork about DBQs. And, you know, I think that the more I read, the better I get at grading them. So I want to practice too. So I appreciate you trusting me and sending them to me. You're so welcome, Wan Ying. Enjoy your dinner. Ashley, I'm not sure where Ethan is. I think he had a uh, AP test today because he's taking several AP tests, not just the AP uh, world. And so he'll probably listen to this later. Tammy says Koreatown in LA. Ooh, fun. If I ever go to LA, I definitely want to do that. Isabella, you're so, so welcome. No problem. Um, <laughs> Gary says, why was I an example? Um, because, Gary, I just know you well enough to know that if I talk about your DBQ, you're going to be like, oh, that's me, that's me. 
me. You know, no matter if it's good or bad, Gary's going to be like, it's me. I mean, am I right, ladies? I mean, chime in. And, and gentlemen, everybody knows Gary. You know he's going to be chiming in. Sephora. Hey, Sephora. Missy. Yes, these are grades. Yes, Sephora. Absolutely. Can I email it to you so you can grade it? Um, I'm going to have a place in Google Classroom for you guys to put them. So don't email them to me quite yet. Uh, okay, NNE says, thank you for the ses sessions. I appreciate it very much. You're so welcome, NNE. Gary said, yeah, that's true. You're so true. Okay, that's right. I, I got I to gotta show this. Gary says, that's true. You know what he's saying, basically? Ms. Z's right. That's right. Don't forget it. Gary said it. Sephora's here. Yes, she is. Uh, so, Tammy, what I'm going to do with Unit 6 DQ, I'm probably not going to have time to type it out tomorrow. I'll probably do it on Saturday, and then I will send you a Google link through the Remind. So just make sure you're a part of the Remind. Sephora, I'll send the Google link um, in our Remind as well for our class. So that will go out to you guys on Saturday. Tomorrow, I probably won't have time because I've got a bunch of other stuff i got to do, but Saturday I will definitely do it. Uh, so Sephora, you can do it online or you can handwrite these notes. Either way you want to do it is fine with me. I would suggest if you don't have a printer at home that you write them. That way you can have them beside you when you're taking the test and you don't have to flip screens. If you write them, you just take a picture and you can submit the picture to me. That's fine. Uh, Gary says, wait, hold on. Uh, we are all doing, okay, so the DBQ for Unit 6, one more time, for the people in the back and Gary, okay? <laughs> I think I went over this, Gary, before you logged on. So what I'm going to do for Unit 6, normally in the lives, I go over how to write the DBQ with you. We're not going to do that this time. What we're going to do is on Saturday, I'm going to send out the Google link to DBQ in this remind as well as if in your my class if you're in my class i'll send it to you as well then i want you to sit down time yourself for 45 minutes once you get done with that 45 minute timer you're going to submit the dbq through a google link that i'm going to have on there it'll be like a google form all right that way they're all in one place and then i will grade it and we will talk about it on tuesday the 19th all right so tuesday the 19th we're not going to be going over the documents like we normally do. We're just going to talk about like how you guys can get better. Okay. The teen says, I don't know what or how I will do on the AP test. Well, we just got to try our best, Fatine. <laughs> and that's all we can do. Uh, Fatine, make sure you're in the remind and then you'll get um, unit six and you can practice that one. Gary says, and sending that or just any random one. So I'm I'm going to send you the one that we're going to go over on Tuesday. Does that make sense? Carol says, thank you, Missy, as a representative for the students whose teachers don't teach. I thank you so much for helping us learn. You are so welcome, Carol. It is my privilege and a blessing to me. Trust me, uh, I definitely enjoy this time. I've enjoyed getting to know you guys, even if it's just digitally. You guys are a fun group, so I've had a great time. Um, Wang Ying, here's the Discord link. Okay, cool. I want to check that out, too. Um, I think that sounds interesting. Um, Fatine says next Thursday is the AP test. I don't know how time has passed so quickly. This year has really went fast. It really has. I feel like time passes quicker uh, when we aren't in school physically. And in the, you are right about that. My day goes so fast and I'm like, dang, where did the day go? I don't know. Uh, and Invictus says, okay, I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. And, um, yeah. Okay. So, just so everybody's clear, if you are a part of the Remind or if you are in my class, I will send it to you as well. On Saturday, I will send you out a link for Unit 6 DBQ that we're going to be going over on Tuesday. However, I want you to write it before Tuesday. All right, so if I give it to you on Saturday, you'll have time Saturday, Sunday, or Monday to write it. Only give yourself 45 minutes. Hadi says, I know how to write a DBQ like I have infused myself for so much knowledge about the DBQ rubric and skills and WAP, but I just need to write one. Okay, good, Cloudy. I got one coming your way on Saturday. <laughs> so if you want to write that, you can. Uh, Wang Ming says, can I add you? Can you pull me in? Okay, okay. So just copy it. All right, they're talking about that. Um, Ashley says, isn't it weird today was supposed to be our AP test? It is weird. It is. Fatin, the remind code is scrolling across the screen right there. So you text it to that and you message that. And yes, actually, it is weird. We would be done by now, but at least you guys have some more time to study. 
Carol says, I need to practice writing fast because my grammar is horrible. Carol, they're not going to grade you on your grammar, believe it or not. So you don't have to worry about that as much. You just have to make sure that you spell it, you know, as close to what you can, you know, get it to the word so that they know what you're talking about. Uh, Gary says, Cloudy, I am that, but I have gotten that too. Uh, where do you join the Remind in the app? Okay, so Cloudy, if you go to the app, there should be like a little join, like plus sign or something like that. And that's where you would um, put in the at YouTube 20. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so there should be like a... Um, a little plus sign somewhere. I'm not seeing it in mine right now. Let me know if you can't find it and I'll try to help you. Uh, the link is not there. Okay, they're talking about that. Just a moment. What is their mind code? So their mind code is right down there on the ticker and it is right here. Text to that and message to that. Gary says uh, they just want to make sure they can understand what they're, yeah as long as they can understand it. Um, but once again, make sure that you explain it well. Don't just say something like, and the Sepoy Rebellion happened. Explain what the Sepoy Rebellion is because they don't, they can't just say, oh, well, they mentioned it, so now they get the points. You have to be able to explain it. With the time limit, they can't expect perfect grammar. That's true, Gary. And I mean, you know, with the time limit, you're probably not going to get all 10 points. It's very difficult to do but you just got to try your best. Cloudy says, I'm in. Sweet. Isabella says, try to make it as accurate, but if you misspell a word and the time is running out, I don't think, yeah, they're not going to take off points if it's misspelled, as long as they can tell what it is. Uh, so just try your best. Uh, Fatim got it. Sweet. Wan Ying says, anyways, thank you, Rachel, even though the link is still not popping up. Okay. All right, Wan Ying, go eat. We'll see what we can do to get you in the Discord. All right, guys. So we are at two minutes and 16 seconds. Thank you so, so much for hanging in there with me. Rose says, any tips on how to check our DBQ? My teacher isn't really helping us practice. Uh, okay, so Rose, you got a couple of options. Um, you can do, first and foremost, for each unit, I have a live over a DBQ. And in those lives, we walk through how to use the organizer. It's in the description of each one of the lives. So what I would suggest is that you grab that organizer and you grab that DBQ for whichever unit you want to do. If you want to do all of them, that's even better. You grab both of those, give yourself 45 minutes to write it, and then watch the video and check yourself through watching the video. If I don't address something that you did in your practice and you have questions about it, you can email me and I'll put my email in the comments. You can email it to me and I will look at it for you and give you some feedback, okay? But first, watch the video and see if I cover it in the video. If there's something outside of the video that we don't talk about, then I can give you feedback any other way. And uh, you said uh, videos are such a savior. Thank you, Rose, I appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed doing them, especially since we're not in class right now. I really miss teaching. Uh, Cloudy says, I really learned a lot of minor details um, in WAP than I have in my actual class, so I just want to say thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. You guys are going to make me cry, like literally. I'm about to cry. You're so sweet. Dustin says, same. It's my teacher's first year teaching AP World. First year is very hard, Dustin. It, it for sure is. I struggled a lot my first year, too, um, but I also am a dork about this stuff, so I learned it really quickly. Hopefully, your teacher will, too. Dustin, you are so welcome. I love helping you guys. Um, Cloudy, I have a DBQ video for every unit. So check those out. They are uh, in the AP prep playlist, I think. Uh, Rose says, thank you so much. This would be the first DBQ I have gotten graded by a teacher. Really? Wow. Crazy. Okay, well, definitely get going. you got all weekend to work on those. And uh, send me any that you still have questions about once you watch the video. I'd be more than happy to help you. I might not get them back to you the, the same day, but I will get them back to you before the test. Gary says, yeah, for some reason, DBQs have gotten kind of fun after doing so many. <laughs> you are a weirdo, a genius weirdo, of course. <laughs> Gary, gosh, Rachel, don't you just, don't you just love him? Don't you just love him? Oh, goodness, Gary. Um, and let's see, Ashley says, how long have you been teaching? Well, I have been teaching AP World. This is my fifth year. 
but I have wanted to be a teacher since I was little. As a matter of fact, this chalkboard behind me was in my very first classroom when I was in kindergarten. I had a little space in my playroom that was set up like a classroom and this chalkboard was in there. Isn't that cool? Like I've come full circle. I still have my, my, uh, my chalkboard. And then my sister was my first student. She is a lucky girl, let me tell you, because she could read before she went to kindergarten because I taught her. She does not like that I remind her of that, though. <laughs> bye, Missy. Or, or bye, Missy. Bye, Rachel. I was reading your comment. Bye. Have a good night. We appreciate you being here and uh, staying up late with us. Have a good night. So technically, Ashley, I've been teaching for a long time, but... <laughs> AP World for five years, and then I did um, American History eighth grade for two years, three three years. I did that for three years, but 10th graders, you guys are my people, man. Eighth graders, they're just a little bit too immature, but 10th graders, I love you guys. You're the best. Cloudy says, wow. <laughs> yes, I've come full circle for sure. Fatine says, what is your suggestion before AP test day? So, Fatine, I'm going to be doing a... Um, a live on the night before the test and I'll give you some last minute suggestions then and uh, that will be on the 20th. We'll be doing that at seven o'clock central time. So join us then and I'll go over that. Invictus, I love it when you quote me. It's it's great. It's great. Love it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the humblest of the humblest and the maturest of the maturest. That's a quote from Gary. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if you have any last minute questions, let me know real quick. And if not, I'm going to hop off of here. We've almost made it to two and a half hours. What? Longest live I've ever done for sure. It's been super fun. I've had a great time hanging out with you guys. And um, I know you're going to do awesome on this exam because here's the thing, guys. It's going to be really hard. But as long as you do your best, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of your hard work. And I really think that, um, you know, it's even if you don't have the score that you want in the long run, it's still worth taking it. It's still good practice and be proud of yourself no matter what you get. You're so welcome, Rose. Good night. Have a good one. Uh, Gary says, have a fun day. And Claudia says, and I was here for it. Yes. <laughs> now I can drink diet vegan Fiji water. All right. Go get your water, Gary. See you later. Uh, Dustin says, if I watch all your videos for the AP test review, do I need to get a review book to help me prepare or should I be fine? Dustin, at this point, <laughs> I would say um, don't worry about the review book because by the time it gets there, it's probably going to be too late. Uh, I would say watch the Amazing Race ones. Those go over every unit that uh, we've done. The DBQ ones are good to watch. Any of them really are good to watch. Um, you might also want to check out um, some of Steve Himmler's videos. He's got some good ones out there about different parts of the DBQ. Definitely check out the explain video that I made about how to explain the DBQ. So yeah, I would just stick with videos at this point. We're too close to the test to really worry about reading and uh, getting deeper into your book. You might want to review notes that you got from class when we were in class. But I think Gary was the one who said it. The test, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, it's probably going to come from units three, four, five, or six. So I would focus mostly on those. Of course, one and two, keep them in your mind for context purposes. But I would focus on the later ones. Gary says, see, it's funny because water had no nutritional value. So having it be a diet vegan makes no sense. I'm a comedic genius. Yes, you are, Gary. Rose says, a review book took me two weeks to finish. Which review book did you do? That's interesting. Um, I have the Princeton one. It's not too bad. It kind of uh, goes over some stuff. But, I mean, at this point, we're just so close to the test that I would stick with the videos that are out there. Of course, you know, all of mine are amazing. Right, Gary? <laughs> There's another quote for you. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but I definitely check out those. And then um, Mr. Himmler has got some good ones as well. Okay, Princeton book. All right, Rose. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I am going to head out of here uh, and uh, go chill for the evening. I will see you back here tomorrow at noon for the big uh, final Jeopardy game. 
I don't know, we might be able to fit one more in, but this one's going to be the big one, okay? This is definitely going to be the big one. Gary, I said, watch all my videos because they're amazing. <laughs> and then I said, just kidding, because I'm not, I'm, I'm very humble, unlike Gary. Uh, Rose says, the Princeton is good, however, it's very long. Yeah, it is very long. So at this point, like I said, Dustin, it's just too close to really worry about the book. I would say just do your best studying. Do your best, like, remembering the timeline of things, remembering uh, specific events that happened. That's all important stuff that you can use for outside evidence. Also, practicing DBQs, that's going to be necessary. <laughs> all right, Gary. Yeah, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to head out of here. I will see you tomorrow at noon if you can join us for the Jeopardy game. If not, look out for the DBQ coming your way sometime on Saturday, probably before noon. I'll try to get that out to you guys so that you can practice, practice, practice that last DBQ that we will go over on Tuesday. And then last but not least, we'll, we will have a live on Wednesday to give you some final tips before going into the test on Thursday. Then on Friday, we're going to have a Zoom party. I'll send the link to the Remind so that we can celebrate the test being over and summer pretty much officially starting. Hopefully you guys don't have to take finals. All right, I will see you guys tomorrow. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in and making this live happen. Guys, we're almost at two and a half hours. Like that's definitely a record. See you all tomorrow. Have a good night.